thanks for coming. First week of term. Um, I, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Joanna Williams from the University of Kent. She's the director of the Study for Higher Education. Sorry, I knew I was going to get that wrong. Um, it wasn't on the Kent website. I've got something else. Director of Program Group for the PG Gets, but the Centre for the Study of Higher Education. She's also the education editor of Spiked, um, and the author of two books which will be interesting to all of us. The first one is Consuming Higher Education, Why Learning Can't Be Bought, which came out in 2012. And then a new book which is out tomorrow, which is very exciting. And if, you, if you like what John has to say, then you want to rush up by it. And it's entitled Academic Freedom in an Age of Conformity, Confronting the Fear of Knowledge. Um, so, welcome, John. Thank you very much, Anthony. Um, I really hate to start a talk on academic freedom with a trigger warning, but I'm afraid I've got to give a bit of a trigger warning to my talk this evening. I've come down with the most terrible cold um, about six hours ago exactly, and the main symptom seems to be that my eyes are streaming constantly, so if I kind of clutch tissues and dab my eyes, just please be reassured that I'm not overwhelmed by the emotion of my own talk. If you want to cry, that's fine. You might be overwhelmed by what I'm about to say. Um, but as I'm saying it myself, I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely not about to burst into tears. I just might look as if I'm about to burst into tears. I'm also not entirely sure, I'm afraid, how long I'm either going to be able to stand up for or how long my voice is going to last out for. So we'll just have to play it by ear a little bit and see how we get along this evening. Um, but I would like to start very much by thanking you all for coming out. Uh, I was just saying to Anthony, the University of Kent, we're still on Christmas vacation. Uh, we've still got another two weeks off. Um, so I was kind of expecting five or six people to be here this evening, so I'm massively grateful for you all coming out. Um, I'd particularly like to thank Bob and Anthony for organising this series of lectures and for inviting me along to, to speak. So as Anthony mentioned, uh, the title of the book that's coming out, or the title of the talk this evening is Academic Freedom in an Age of Conformity, um, Confronting the Fear of Knowledge, which is also just, just purely coincidentally the title of the book which is coming out tomorrow. Um, it's a real mouthful, I'm afraid, but um, publishers nowadays seem to put an onus on book titles being as Googleable as possible, any words, random words that you might put into Google, they want their book title or my book title in this instance to come up as the first ranking. And in order to secure the book contract, I would have agreed to anything, quite frankly, whatever they wanted the title to be. So I got in line and conformed with that, which is, is kind of quite interesting, I guess, given what I'm going to be talking about. Um, what I want to do is to use some of the ideas that I discuss in my book as a means of proposing my answer to the question posed in the title series of uh, the series for this lecture, the, the lecture series overall of what should universities be. Um, because I um, have been accused in the past, and you can tell me in the discussion afterwards whether you would share this accusation, but the, the accusation that's always levelled against me is that I'm a golden ageist, and uh, that I'm naive, and that I'm an old romantic, and like I said, I'd be very interested to see if you share these um, assertions, which I dispute a lot. Um, but the reason why I'm accused of being a golden ageist is because I tend to think that the answer to the question, what's the purpose of a university, or what should universities be for, is quite obvious and also quite simple, that it should be involved with knowledge, that it should be involved with the pursuit and the transmission of knowledge. And I always thought this was quite obvious and, and to me always seemed quite, quite straightforward, quite commonsensical, um, until I had the response to my first book, which, which as Anton mentioned, was Consuming Higher Education, Why Learning Can't Be Bored. And um, I was quite taken aback by the reaction to that book. Um, it, the reaction tended to be very, very favourable, very positive. 
um, amongst people who hadn't actually read the book. Um, because people who just read as far as the title uh, tended to assume that they were in complete agreement with everything that I'd written and that the book was obviously a, a kind of tract against neoliberalism. Um, people who actually read the book tended to be less positive, which is a terrible thing to admit. Um, and the thing that people tended to get very riled by, which took me incredibly by surprise, was my conclusion in that book, which was that tuition fees are, are not great, uh, but that the purpose of a university is concerned with knowledge and is concerned with the transmission of knowledge, and knowledge is a public good, and as a public good, not we should taxpayers, I suppose I'm, I'm saying in the, the we here, should be prepared to fund universities as they are concerned with the pursuit of knowledge. Obviously the other side of that argument was that if universities are solely concerned with providing people with skills for employability so that they can go away and enhance their own prospects, their own private capital as a, as a kind of private investment in the labour market, then you know perhaps that's not something that the taxpayer might want to pay. What got people's backs up was this assertion that universities should be in the business of knowledge. Um, the questions that were put to me again and again was, well, whose knowledge? Who decides? Um, what do I mean by knowledge? Who, who is it that should determine what this body of knowledge should be? And I wasn't expecting those questions, and I was really quite taken aback to receive that response. Um, what came across to me was almost, oh, well, certainly awareness of knowledge, um, almost tantamount to, a, to a, a, if not a fear of knowledge, then certainly a, a, a fear of, of truth claims, a fear that there may be any connection between knowledge and truth. That was really, I think, what, what people meant. They weren't really saying whose knowledge, what they were really saying was whose truth. Who am I to say that there could be a connection between knowledge and truth? And the idea that knowledge could be connected to a search for truth was something that, that upset an awful lot of people and, and surprised me the extent to which it, it upset people. Um, academic freedom is something that I, I, I guess I've always been interested in, I guess just as much as everybody is. I didn't really have any special interest in academic freedom, um, but it was only when I, I kind of made the connection between academic freedom, the fight for academic freedom on the one hand, and this fear of knowledge and started to question why is, is, is academic freedom being eroded nowadays, being threatened nowadays, which I'll come on to talk about, and this kind of disregard for knowledge, disregard for truth claims, that I began to think a bit more seriously about academic freedom. Because to me, academic freedom lies at the heart of my vision of what a university should be for. Um, it's academic freedom that allows us to question existing orthodoxies. It's academic freedom that allows us to test out new ideas. It's academic freedom that allows for what I think is most important when I talk about the connection between knowledge and truth, which is the ultimate contestability of truth claims connected to knowledge. I'm certainly not going to stand here and argue that there's such a thing as a, a kind of truth claim for all time. I think the important thing about the connection between knowledge and truth is that truth must be permanently contestable, must be permanently open to question. Um, and, and in order for us to be constantly questioning truth claims, academic freedom is fundamentally important to this. So this evening I want to argue three things. Firstly, I want to argue that academic freedom has been and is being eroded from many different sources nowadays, uh, from government anti-terrorism legislation, uh, but all, also as, as widely discussed in the media recently, um, a new generation of censorious students. And um, it'd be very interesting uh, uh, to, to see in the discussion afterwards what people think about some of the, the, the term student politics at 
appears to have taken nowadays. Um, <coughs> most significantly, and perhaps most controversially, I also want to argue that academics themselves are playing a key role in eroding academic freedom, that academics themselves often shun intellectual dissent and shun debate and feel happier promoting conformity to particular values. So that's the first thing I want to argue. The second thing I want to look at is how this erosion of academic freedom has both resulted from and contributed to the demands of knowledge from the academy. And finally, I want to look at how, although the rhetoric of academic freedom remains within the academy today, it's been really separated from this pursuit of knowledge and what perhaps we can start doing to regain a sense of the importance of academic freedom and, and its connection to knowledge. So, so to begin with, this idea of that academic freedom is being eroded from students, by students, because I think this is a really important trend in politics nowadays. And I'm sure you don't need me to rattle off a long list of things that have been banned from particular universities, everything from sombreros to the Sun newspaper, um, to I think Robin Thicke's hit song, think of it whatever you will, it's certainly no great pop song, but banned from 32 universities, ultimately. Uh, obviously there's a kind of real irony to this because I have a, a nine-year-old daughter and um, this is probably a terrible, terrible indictment of my parenting, so please no one quote me on this at all. Um, but I could take her to school in the car in the morning, blurred lines would come on the radio, she'd sing along to it, knowing every word. I would then drop her off at school, continue five minutes more up the road to a university campus of 19, 20, 21 year olds predominantly, um, for whom that song couldn't be played on the university or, or certainly within the student union of that university. And, and obviously, uh, certainly, I think to last year, um, words like trigger warning, microaggression, cultural appropriation have really entered the vocabulary. So again, another quick anecdote about my nine-year-old. I caught her, well, not caught her, she came up screaming to me the other day, uh, complaining about her older brother, as she likes to do all the time. Harry's microaggressing me. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously she's got peculiar parents, but the idea that this kind of language has really now seeped into the vocabulary of everybody, uh, I think really kind of shows uh, how, how the, the kind of um, traction that these ideas have gained, cultural appropriation being another one that I had uh, uh, referring to in terms of uh, some I won't even pretend to know the name of the, the pop star she was accusing of this. Um, and there's, I'm sure you've been aware, a great deal of hand wringing in the press over um, these censorious students and, and lots of kind of standing back and looking on in, in abject horror. Where has this generation of students come from? Where can these trends lead? What can we do about this? But I think what's very interesting from, from my point of view and the things I want to talk about this evening is how most of this, this kind of hand wringing and looking on in horror uh, comes from outside the academy. And there's very few, it seems to me, and again, please um, correct me if you think I'm wrong in the discussion afterwards, there seems to be very little uh, condemnation of censorious students to emerge from within the academy. Um, and I think there's a, a real danger at the moment that it can appear as if universities condone this censoriousness <coughs> that emerges within students. I must say at this point, sorry, I must really stress that I don't think this is this censoriousness that I'm referring to is representative of the student body as a whole. Um, I, I'm very firmly of the belief that this is a vocal minority of students in particular institutions. Unfortunately, it tends to be the students who get elected onto NUS executive. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody remembers the whole kind of jazz hands debacle which emerged 
emerged from NUS conference last year with the idea that clapping could be potentially triggering. Um, at the end of the speech, by the way, the people don't clap, I should find that very triggering. Never <laughs> mind, <laughs> jazz hands. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I, you know, there, there's a kind of a, a real vocal minority, and, and I think the danger is that it can often appear as if it's the vocal minority which speak for everyone, and I, I think it's it, precisely because it's a vocal minority that it is even more important um, that this vocal minority is, is challenged and taken up on the censoriousness that they're introducing into the academy. Um, but like I said, the, the thing I'm most concerned about is why more academics don't come out and, and criticise this term in student politics. And I think there's a, there's a few reasons why this is the case. I think one reason is government legislation, as we've said, the PREVENT strategy um, actually enforces universities to check speakers, to monitor behaviour of students, to report people who may appear to be becoming radicalised. And the idea, and, and I certainly am aware that this is something that happens at my own institution, the idea that you have a group of students um, in the student union who are prepared to enact this no platforming, again another expression that's come to the fore, the idea that you have a group of students who are themselves prepared to enact this no platforming of particular speakers actually absolves university managers of having to do this. The university managers are then able to wash their hands and say, well, it's not us who've banned these speakers, it's the students who've done it. And I, and I, I think there's a, a group of university managers who are quite happy with that situation and are reluctant to criticise students for doing the dirty work that they would have to do otherwise. Unfortunately, if managers were quicker to step in, or, or rather if students were less enthusiastic about enforcing no platforms themselves, they would force university managers into having to no platform speakers. And then the direction that government legislation is taking would perhaps become a bit more obvious. The problem is when it's students doing this banning, it doesn't look as if it's directly brought about as a result of government legislation. And, and the government gets let off the hook, the university managers get let off the hook. So I think that's one reason why universities aren't so quick to condemn, censor, uh, aren't so quick to condemn censorious students. I think another reason that I'm sure many people here might be familiar with is the tyranny of the NSS, the tyranny of student satisfaction. If, if our aim as university lecturers or as universities is to score highly in student satisfaction rankings, um, which obviously I'm sure you all are aware are all important in the league table position in recruiting the next cohort of, of student customers, then why it's not in our best interests to challenge students. It it's becomes much more in the interests of lecturers to flatter and to appease. And I know that's a, a kind of very blunt way of putting it, but unfortunately I think that's the case. Why would you challenge students directly or, or make their lives too uncomfortable if your aim is for them to be satisfied? I think a, a further reason, just to mention very briefly, is that it, it's kind of too easy, I think, for lecturers to say that what students get up to in the NUS is, is none of their business, that this is a matter just for students. Um, I think, certainly at my own institution and most universities I'm familiar with, NUS executives are um, elected, are, are actually a handful of the student body, and are elected by a time proportion of students overall. I think at my own university something like 12% of students voted in the elections for the NUS executive. So what you have, as I was saying earlier, about this, this kind of vocal minority, but I think what the vocal minority then does is enforce bans <coughs> which then affect everybody on the university campus. They chill, and again this is a kind of Americanism, but they chill free speech on campus. They send out the idea that there are some things that can't be said, some ideas which are too dangerous. And I think that that's a, a, a dodgy ground for us to be going down. Um, I think um, one reason 
why, um, well, I think one thing that reassures me, if you like, when I'm kind of having low moments, is that uh, lecturers do seem to have a, a fondness for academic freedom. Academic freedom is a value that many lecturers still hold dear. Um, I think you can see this in campaigns against things like the prevent legislation, but you also see it in the cases of particular individuals. So again, going back to last summer, there were, there were two academics, I would say, who were most frequently in the headlines. Uh, one being from America, Stephen Salater, I'm sure lots of people have heard of him, uh, who uh, was offered a job at the University of um, Illinois, uh, only for the job offer to be rescinded. There were lots of disputes as to whether this was because of um, tweets that he'd sent out which had been labeled as anti-Semitic, um, or whether what, what emerged later was that, that fund as benefactors to the university had threatened to withdraw funding if he was allowed to continue in his job uh, and obviously Stephen Salita has become um, this, this is going to sound scathing I don't necessarily mean it this way but the kind of the poster boy if you like for academic freedom in the United States um, whilst Stephen Salita was being discussed in America in this country we were discussing the case again some, someone I'm sure you, whose name you're all familiar with uh, Thomas Doherty, who was suspended for nine months from Warwick University for the, the kind of heinous crime of uh, inappropriately sighing, <laughs> um, which kind of just beggars belief, really, uh, and, and you know, worries me a lot as somebody who has a, a propensity to sigh on a regular basis. <laughs> um, but uh, you can see how in, in both of these cases, the, the words academic freedom do come to the fore and this is some, something that people do look to to defend their own position. So, so having this kind of rhetorical cherishing of academic freedom, if you like, kind of makes it even more curious in some ways as to why on the one hand there's this commitment to academic freedom and on the other hand, there's this reluctance to take up sensory students. And um, thinking this through and coming back to what I was taught, um, kind of my thoughts in, in terms of knowledge and what knowledge means today, I think one thing that, that um, has become quite popular intellectual trend, or not become, but has been for, for many decades, popular intellectual trends within particularly humanities faculties might offer us one explanation for this. I think often, particularly within humanities and social science, um, students are actually taught many of the ideas that, that underpin the censorship that they have today. So, so one idea that I think gets, gets taught uh, and, and kind, of, kind of has firmly taken root within the humanities is this idea that language constructs reality that language is all important in constructing the world around us, that truth is multiple, that truth is perspectival, um, and that, that the world is constructed through words, and as the world is constructed through words and images, these words and images can, can wound, can do real kind of psychic harm to us. I think one useful illustration of this perhaps is with the Roads Must Fall campaign that's ongoing at Oxford University which has been in the news over the past couple of weeks and you can see how there's a real belief that, that this statue, inanimate object, inflicts real psychic harm upon people and I think the, this idea that words can wound, that statues can inflict real psychic harm upon people um, really takes root within faculties of humanities. Um, to me it's a, a kind of real, I mean I guess you know my own political background um, from, from being a teenager uh, was, was Marxism and I guess the way I see it is what's happened is a real turning on its head of the old kind of Marxist doctrine that um, people's conditions, material conditions, the material conditions that people labour under shape 
their perception of the world and what you've got, it seems to me, is almost the complete inverse of that, rather than people's material conditions shaping the perception that they have of the world. It's almost now as if people are taught that their perceptions of the world shape the material conditions in which they find themselves. And to me, I think that's very, very problematic because I think what you then have is a real blurring of the boundaries between uh, where reality, if you like, starts and stops, where fantasy starts and stops, where the realm of ideas and words and the idea of reality starts and stops. So the idea that pictures in the same newspaper, posters, song lyrics, statues can cause sexism, racism, homophobia has become very entrenched. To my mind, pictures, statues, song lyrics reflect a material reality that has entrenched racism, sexism, homophobia within it, rather than the other way around. It's certainly an awful lot easier, you could argue, to ban a particular poster or a particular song than it is to take up some of the more underlying material, political problems that we face in society. But when students are taught that language constructs reality, when students are taught that words can wound, then really it should come as no surprise then when students demand a trigger warning for reading a classic work of literature. If they've been taught that the images and words that they're going to use can inflict psychic harm upon them, and that psychic harm is on a continuum with real violence, the idea that trigger warnings should be provided is commonsensical, or is commonsensical to the mind of people who, who take this particular view. And obviously, I, I would argue that the trigger warning is really just one step away from censorship. If, we're, if, if student satisfaction is our aim, then why, why risk presenting students with anything that might be potentially triggering and <coughs> just remove that content in the first place? I think one other reason why lecturers are reluctant to challenge student censors is that many politically support the cause that students are propounding, or that are, you know, they are fearful themselves of potentially appearing to be sexist or racist or homophobic. And many lecturers themselves, unfortunately, I think, do see censorship as a better way of dealing with ideas they disagree with than actually engaging in debate and actually having difficult discussions out. I think one thing, again, that I would really like to make clear at this point, there's always a danger when you argue for free speech, when I stand here and argue that I don't think the Sun newspaper should be banned, I don't think Robin Thicke's Blurred Lines is the worst song in the world and should be banned, that it can look as if I support <coughs> UKIP, the Sun newspaper, Robin Thicke, that I think these are like a really, really great idea and I would rush out and buy them. But that couldn't be further from the case, and, and in a way this shouldn't even need saying, but discussions around free speech and academic freedom have become so confused nowadays that unfortunately I think it really does need stressing that, that to argue that some newspaper shouldn't be banned is not the same as saying, you know, I would buy every copy and cut out the picture of page three and, and stick it on the wall as a collage and think it was the most wonderful thing in the world. In fact, it's, it's absolutely the opposite that's the case. I believe in free speech and I believe in academic freedom precisely because there are so many ideas I disagree with and I want those ideas to be out in the open so that I can argue against them because I actually am arrogant enough to think that my arguments against bad ideas are better than the bad ideas. And if they're not, I want the opportunity to go away and learn why my idea, my arguments are not working and I want to be able to hone my arguments or perhaps even alter my point of view. No, not really, but <laughs> or perhaps 
of my point of view, but to hone my arguments and think how I could do better next time in taking up arguments that I disagree with. But unfortunately, this idea doesn't seem to have much traction nowadays. So again, names from a name from last year that I'm sure everybody is familiar with is, is Tim Hunt, Nobel Prize winning scientist, made a, a depending on your point of view, a joke, a sexist remark. I think the jury's still out as to what exactly the nature of the comment was that he made or what was intended by this comment uh, to do with women crying in labs and therefore not being um, particularly good scientists was the general gist of it. Obviously, I think this is a stupid remark. It's not something that I would agree with at all. And if I met Tim Hunt, I would say to him, this is stupid and not true. Um, the idea that somebody should be pushed into a position where they resign their post because of this stupid comment, I think is unwarranted. Yet it was academics who were pushing for this, were at the forefront of this big expose of Tim Hunt. A uh, debate that took place at LSE at the beginning of last year called Is Rape Different? Um, one of the speakers in this debate um, was making an argument against rape myths. And she basically argued that not all beliefs about rape that are labelled as, as myths are actually rape myths. Again, you know, you can agree with her or disagree with her. I, I don't know enough about her argument to, to say one way or another, but I think this is something that needs to be had out. It was academics who launched, in effect, a petition against LSE and asked, them not, asked LSE not to promote the particular viewpoint that was propounded in that debate because it would be dangerous, it would... Um, I'm loath to say promote rape because I'm sure that's not what they meant, but I guess it would prevent women from coming, rape survivors from coming forward and, and being able to talk about their own experiences of rape, I guess was the argument. But, but what you had there was a petition from one group of academics trying to silence another academic. Um, in the case of, of a campaign for boycott, divestment and sanctions against Israeli universities, again you have one group of academics silencing another group of academics, which again, you know, I, I feel we need to point out, doesn't mean to say I would politically support everything that Israel gets up to, but the idea that we can actually um, have debates and discussions about these ideas, I think it's important. The problem is, if we put political provisos on what can be said, then we lose academic freedom for everyone because immediately you make the assumption that there must be somebody somewhere who can sit in judgment, somebody somewhere who has more moral clout than I have, who is able to argue that these ideas are good ideas, this nationality is a good idea, this was a joke, this was a bit of joke, um, and, and able to pass judgment. And as soon as we put political or moral or biological factors in place for judging who has the right to speak and who, who doesn't have the right to speak, then we lose academic freedom for everyone. And I think, as I was indicating earlier, academic freedom can be held in such light regard nowadays that academics themselves are prepared to, to give it away is because it has become separated from the pursuit of knowledge. Um, we can see, if you look back at the, the kind of history of knowledge, if you like, that it was really after the Second World War that enlightenment values um, that connected knowledge to the pursuit of truth um, first began to be seriously called into question. Um, I would link this to um, the experience of the Holocaust and the way the Holocaust was seen as being uh, uh, the epitome, if you like, wrongly I think, but, but it was judged by many as being the epitome of, of the logic, the rational logic of where enlightenment values lead to, the, the uh, logic of where 
uh, an emphasis upon science, upon the pursuit of truth might lead. And so the idea that, that this led people to question a, a broader enlightenment concept of knowledge and the pursuit of truth um, led to the, this kind of collapse of uh, uh, this, the, the connection, if you like, or uh, suddenly a wariness emerging at that time between knowledge and truth. And, and trends that began to take root in the academy at that time connected to critical theory, uh, connected to the impact of feminism, I would argue, even within the academy, um, did lead to this belief that language constructs reality, which I talked about earlier, that the personal is political, that truth is, is just a question of individual perspective, um, that, that canons need to, are, are elitist and need to be called into question, um, that, that knowledge and the, the kind of imparting of knowledge is, I think, bourgeois, of course, a, a form of symbolic violence. Um, and, and these ideas that have taken root have separated knowledge um, from truth and separated the academy from the pursuit of knowledge. And I think when, when universities become or, or became separated from knowledge as a goal, you obviously you create a vacuum you create a vacuum at the heart of higher education. You, you rob higher education of its chief raison d'etre. And I, I think since the Second World War, or probably more accurately since about the 1970s, two things have filled that vacuum. I think one um, is something that, that many people, well, okay, well, I won't say many people this group because I don't know, but, but one, one thing I think that's filled this vacuum is from, from the government's perspective, is the focus on skills for employability, is the focus on um, human capital, is the focus on um, scientific advance for the benefit of the nation, for the benefit of the national economy. And this was the first thing to emerge in, in higher education in the early 70s. I said theories to do with human capital came over from the States. Um, and you can see a shift, I think, that's taken place between the 70s and the 1990s, where, first of all, the idea of knowledge as a, uh, of, of universities as serving a kind of instrumental purpose was, first of all, considered to be for the nation. This idea of knowledge, like I said, driving economic development, driving industry, driving uh, scientific advance. You know, this is the era of the white heat of technology. I think. Many academics react, instinctively react against this. We don't like to think that we are just in the business of, of job training. Um, it, it seems quite crude to think, and, it, and it, it's written off as a, as a kind of neoliberal agenda, this idea that we should just be um, training people up to fulfil a useful role in the economy, to go out there as, as citizens who can kind of further the course of capitalism, to be dramatic about it. Um, I think another thing then that's come in, perhaps in response, a reaction away from the job training thing, is the promotion of particular values within the academy. And I, I think this is just as problematic as the promotion of skills for employability. But it, it kind of sounds nicer. So the kind of values that I'm talking about can be found in the titles of, of courses that are offered at some universities, um, and uh, sustainable development, business for sustainable um, development. Um, I mean, you have courses at MA, course at York University, Advanced and Equality, Rights and Inclusion. Uh, again, I, I, I mean, the university has a centre for feminist research. And my, my gripe with these particular course titles is not a particular gripe with sustainability, advanced equality, rights and inclusion, or, sen or feminism, so much as the fact that the conclusions are, it would seem to me, foregone, that, that it would be very difficult if you were studying in a centre for feminist research to argue something which was a feminist <coughs> or to take a course in sustainable development uh, where the, the title of the course is sustainable development 
and make the case for massive capitalist growth and expansion of nuclear power. And I think if you look at other things like the promotion of global citizenship within higher education, when we, we move into the business of, of putting values at the heart of the curriculum, we take knowledge out of the curriculum and, and we end up teaching students not how to think, but teaching students what to think. And particularly when this is met with assessments which are run the risk of assessing students' values, it does leave the question of how free students are to dissent from this moral or values written agenda that's being put before them. Again, to kind of um, go back to my old Marxist roots, I think there's a real danger that, and this is going to be an, a kind of incredibly blunt and no doubt offensive thing to say, but that kind of old lefties within the academy haven't given up on a dictatorship of a proletariat, instead seek to force a, a dictatorship of the doctorates. That's because we are the educated elite, we know best about sustainability and feminism and inclusivity and the horrors of Robin Thicke and the sun. And um, because we are an academic elite, we can impose our values on everyone else. One thing that struck me as very interesting um, was, I'm sure an article people saw in the Times Higher Education uh, before the general election where the Times Higher ran a survey of the voting intentions of academics. And I can't remember the exact statistics, but it certainly showed that academics were way, way, way more likely to uh, report their intent to vote for either the Labour Party or the Green Party than the general population as a whole. And I think one problem, um, and one reason why the promotion of values has taken such a, has gained such a hold <coughs> in academia is because we have, I think, an emerging political consensus within academia uh, within academics that, that there is this political consensus and the danger with any political consensus is that you end up, um, it ends up reproducing itself, that you create this culture of conformity which I'm talking about in the title of my book where it becomes very difficult for students or for academics um, to challenge this prevailing political consensus. Um, again, I've talked about the NSS, I think another very damaging government policy that's shaping academia an awful lot at the moment is, is the REF, um, which is a, is a real tyranny, I think, um, shaping the research that academics undertake. But when you make something like the REF take on such a, a <coughs> fundamentally important role within the academy, and then I, I don't know about it, Brian, but certainly at my own institution, What's really promoted to people very, very directly is the importance of publishing in four-star journals, which you then discover is a very, very narrow range of journals indeed. And um, not at Kent, I'm pleased to say, but at another university I conducted some research at, academics are then told quite explicitly, these are the journals that you must aim to publish in the best way to ensure publication in these journals is to find out what are the kind of hot button issues, what are the current issues within your discipline, to have a look and see um, who is on the editorial board of those particular journals, to cite and quote some of the people who are on the editorial board, ideally within the first page of your journal article so that it passes through the peer review. When, when we put all these factors in place, the idea that you would say something then radically opposing the general direction in which your discipline is heading, you either have to be very brave or very foolish to do that. I was just saying to Anthony before I came in, I had my own experience of this uh, 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 just before Christmas. I wrote an article in the Times Higher which was critical of the government's latest green paper. And um, for the first few days after it came out, I came, 
sat there and patted myself on the back and received a great deal of, of positive feedback for this article. Uh, and then I noticed, before I went to bed, stupidly checking emails before I went to bed one evening, that a mailing list, which I'm on, and all my colleagues at work are on, and my boss is on, um, somebody had posted uh, an email to this mailing list along the lines of, this stupid, ignorant woman, has she ever stepped foot inside a university? How can she possibly comment on these issues she clearly knows nothing about? Um, by the time I woke up the following morning, this, these emails had gone, well, gone within the space of about five emails to this list from this stupid woman to criticism of the Centre for the Study of Higher Education I run at Kent, to criticism of my colleagues, like so all of whom were on this mailing list, to finally a call for uh, a, a response with signatures, in effect a, a petition. I'm not quite sure what against against me or against the article. I'm quite tough by now at taking this kind of thing on the chin, but I strongly suspect that colleagues younger or less experienced than me would learn pretty rapidly that if you don't want to come in for this kind of criticism, don't stick your neck out and write opinion pieces in the Times higher. <coughs> Certainly if you want to get promoted or if you want even just to have a quiet life, don't be so foolish as to write opinion pieces in the Times Higher. Um, I can see time's running, I will, I will conclude. So the, the main points I, I've kind of wanted to make this evening, I, I hope I've been easily <coughs> coherent, I hope I've made them in some ways. If, if I have one, please do, like I said, please do question me. But, but the main point I wanted to really make is that I don't think higher education can exist in any meaningful sense at all without academic freedom. It does just become job training or a kind of moral indoctrination if we don't have academic freedom for both staff and students, lecturers, academics and students alike, to be able to question everything, to question every prevailing orthodoxy. And I think there are lots of threats to academic freedom today coming from all different kinds of directions. A marketised sector which makes us a uh, tout for customers, um, and, uh, uh, government policy, academics themselves. I think there's lots and lots of, of threats to academic freedom. Um, but we can take some faith in the fact that academics are still keen, if nothing else, on the rhetoric of academic freedom. And I think that's really important. Um, but I, I think academic freedom is really important so that we can let the best ideas in society win out. And I think for this reason, academic freedom is, is so important for people who are not in the elite, either an academic elite or an elite based on any other characteristic. I think, just finally then, very, very briefly, in order to really defend academic freedom nowadays, to reassert the importance of academic freedom, I think quite rightly, again, really, really stress here, quite rightly, um, universities have paid an awful lot of attention over the past two or three decades to widening participation, to bringing a more diverse body, student body, into academia. And I think that's been so important. But I think one thing that's perhaps been forgotten in all of that is the importance of intellectual diversity, the importance of political diversity. And I think if we want to protect academic freedom going forward, we need to place just as much importance upon political and intellectual diversity as we have done upon social diversity over the past few decades. Because unless you have people who can ask those awkward questions, who can kind of say, well, I don't agree with you, and this is why I don't agree with you, even if they're wrong, and they probably are wrong, but unless you have people who can ask those awkward questions, you're, you're, you, you run the risk of just leading to confirmation bias in any research that goes on. We run the risk of turning academia into a giant echo chamber where we might have the rhetoric of academic freedom, but it, it's meaningless in reality. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.
on your point about knowledge of information, you know, I couldn't agree more. The most depressing thing I had, again, mother of a nine-year-old, going to the talk by the head teacher at my daughter's junior school, who basically stood there in front of all the parents and said, well, all your kids carry around with them something which gives them access to everything they're ever going to want to know. Therefore, we're not going to teach them anything at this school. Um, which quite, you know, I kind of nearly cried. But um, I didn't, and she still goes to that school. But yeah, that, that seems to generally be the consensus. If you've got Google, you don't need to know anything. And I think this really, really, and I think, you know, the, the more we have Google, the more there's a role for teaching people important wisdom, I think, is a word that's very underused nowadays. Okay, I've got loads now. God, I knew this was happening. <laughs> you go first, and then. We'll maybe group them in three or four, depending on their length. Nice and quick. Okay. Um, it's, I, don't, um, I agree with your point about this relates to wider in society than the universities and sectarians. But we're going back to Foucault. Foucault, of course, talks about power. And that seems to me to relate very much to any, um, how to to resonate is the word I'm looking for in a world where we're, we're frightened of power. In a, and in, uh, I mean, at least that's how it seems to me. I don't know whether you would agree with that in a broad sense, and, and could not just governmental power, of course, call but you know, many, many forms of power. Um, we, we, uh, we feel helpless in this society uh, for reasons which I'm not sure I fully understand. Okay, Tom. Yeah, I just wanted to people to take what you said. Words don't hurt. Words don't form reality. Why is your whole talk being revolving around words and the effect words has on your reality and your emotions, etc.? Um, top left. Um, so I think quite a bit about the road statue. Sorry, I think a bit about the road statue and it being material. So, like you said, the road statue, people are making, people like taking part in it or is it that the statue has entrenched racism in it because it's not about it? Um, so, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll come back to the question about power first of all, but I think the point you've made is superb. You know, I think that's a really, really important point. Um, I think our relationship with language like nowadays is, is very confused. Uh, and uh, not just my relationship with language, but, but I'm talking in a much broader kind of political and epistemological sense. Um, I think, on the one hand, we set far too much store by language, which I guess is what I've been arguing. But on the other hand, I think um, we also do. I, I, I would be lying, obviously, wouldn't I, if I didn't think that words were important in changing people's opinion about things, in being able to argue, in being able to make a case. But I think, I think the problem is that we have a very degraded view of people nowadays. We have a very degraded view of politics, and we have a very degraded view of humanity. I guess my view of words. Um, stems from and is driven by a view that everybody is pretty much the same as me, that I think as I take words rationally and uh, am able to, capable of following a logical argument, I tend to assume that everybody else can and does think like that and operate like that too. I think one problem politically, and this is why I made the point about universities not being in a bubble, but being part of society, is that the left, politically the left, has lost an awful lot of faith in the electorate, in people generally, and in the, the view of people in being able to follow rational arguments, being able to be confronted by ideas that are unpleasant, but are kind of robust enough to be able to argue against these ideas. So this is why the idea of the, the, the statue, then, the, the issue of the statue um, comes into this. Words are important because words e enable us to look at the legacy of Rhodes as an old colonialist, imperialist, 
you could argue man of his time, certainly somebody who was responsible for lots of bad things. So that's an incredibly simplistic way of putting it, but hopefully you know what I mean. I'm not trying to deny uh, the colonial and, and imperial legacy that he was fundamentally a part of. Um, but a statue is a lump of concrete, and whether it's it, whether we really go as, to, as so far as to say that a statue then becomes entrenched racism, I, I think is a step too far. I don't think a statue reflects entrenched racism. I think a statue is a, a, a lump of concrete, and, and I don't think a statue inflicts psychic harm upon people. I think we can have the debate out, we can have the discussion, we can talk about the past and what happened, but whether a statue actually inflicts psychic harm on people, I think is a step too far. Yeah, I think like flat steel salts probably make them but yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got Molly next. Yeah, um, I was just wondering what you meant by free speech. Like, do you have free speech and how do you have this free speech? Okay, Dave Gould. Sorry for saying Dave Gould, but just because you know, always, <laughs> always the other Daves are around as well. Yeah, um, yeah. But it's a question about the um, censorship by students. Um, I see that kind of censorship, if you call it that for argument's sake, as not a limit to academic freedom, but a response to what is already an extremely limited academic freedom. So um, an example is, we studied for a year critical traditions in Western thought, and my friend who studies the um, ideas of women of colour timed it, literally timed it on a stopwatch, and throughout the entire year, only 15 minutes was devoted to the ideas of women of colour. So, that, so this was a course on women of colour? No, this is a course of Western thought. Ah, for so a year, sorry, sorry. it was only 15 minutes dedicated to that. So this censorship isn't trying to limit freedom, I think it's more a response to what's already a limited freedom. But can you explain to me how censorship would challenge limited freedom of speech? Yeah, it operates in the pretense that once you're in the university, it's just free for all, all ideas are out there. We can openly discuss, etc, etc, but when we only learn the ideas of a certain type of people, then the idea is that only those types of people's ideas matter. So then the response is, okay, well, if we're not going to study it, we're not going to learn it, we're not going to be engaging with these ideas, we're going to go forward and just take action to our own hand. This is what we think. Thank you. Um, Jonathan? Yeah, I just want to follow on from that point. I, I just thought your uh, conception of debate seems seem to assume that debate always proceeds from a neutral basis, and of course it doesn't. So, just, I mean, I think you said what we did it, where we're wants to say, but that, you know, of course we want to debate, and ideally you don't censor things, but I'm curious about some of the points that you make. Would you be against, for example, the campaign to ban page three, if you believe that words don't wound, presumably you'd want to do away with the laws such as incitement to hatred, uh, incitement to uh, violence. Um, and finally, if statues and other kinds of images are simply lumps of concrete, then they've been responsible for an awful lot of uh, um, trouble. Statues the or the people that? It does, you see, this is the thing. It, 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 Wherever you locate it, images such as statues, paintings, other kinds of images are incredibly powerful. They have power. Now, that, that, you can argue that that may be in the minds of the people that respond to it, but nevertheless, to, to try to deny that, that that power exists and, and has agency, yeah. I think is, is incredibly, it seems very reductive to me, quite kind of positivist. See, I would argue that Rose when he was alive, obviously, had a great deal of power. But clearly his statue continues to have power. Otherwise, these these issues wouldn't be arising. So it, 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 I don't know, it seems like it, it seems incontrovertible. Do you want to respond yeah, to those three? Yes, yeah, thank you. 
Um, so, first of all, on the question about free speech, uh, again, a very important question. Uh, I mean, my idea is that free speech means freedom within the law, and this is where the point comes in about incitement to violent, violence, hate speech. I think within the law, people should be free to say whatever they want. Yes, I do think in this country, the law goes too far in restricting freedom of speech. Uh, with libel laws and hate speech laws, I think those are laws that I would like to see overturned. I would what, so see laws are always just and right? Honest. Is that Sorry. what? So, Law is always just and right. Is that no, that's, no, no, exactly. That's why I'm saying there are laws I disagree with and laws I would like to see overturned. But I, I think free speech means within the law you can say whatever you want to say. Well, even if those laws are wrong in your... No, no, I'm saying I do think the laws are wrong. I think well, why, why do you have freedom? Sorry, if we're going to have a one-to-one, -one, yeah. it would be much better Sorry, to do it Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, no, I think free speech means freedom within the law. I think the problem is many universities nowadays over-interpret the law, so there is no law against Robin Thicke's blurred lines. There is no law against the sun. Universities or students' unions within universities over-interpret the law. So even if you look at the anti-terrorism, the prevent strategy, it's, it's terrible legislation. Again, it would be another very good example of a place where I think the law gets it wrong. I often think the law gets it wrong. Um, uh, but worse, if you like, is the way that many universities um, put forward a, a kind of precautionary principle that means that they over-interpret the law and, and, and enforce a censorship that goes beyond even that which is expected by the law. Um, free speech is not nice, you know. <laughs> It, it's not nice, and it's not nice to hear views that you disagree with. It's not nice to see statues that we don't like. You know, I, I'm not going to stand here and, and pretend that free speech creates a nice world of, of motherhood and apple pie where everything is lovely and nice. It doesn't, but that's democracy, and that's called being confronted by views that you don't like and being confronted by people whose views you disagree with. But, but the beauty of it, where it is nice, is those same freedoms that, that force us to have the unpleasant task of confronting things that we don't like also permit us the freedom to be able to argue against ideas that we don't like. And that, that's the beauty of it. Another reason why free speech is not nice, it, it relates to what, what you were saying, Again, it would be incredibly naive of me to stand here and argue that everybody has the same access to the media, um, to come back to the point that you were making at the top there, like, that everybody in a university has the power, which is a powerful position, to set out a curriculum to dictate what should be taught and when. You know, not everybody does have the same power, the same access, the same voice, but to my mind, it's for that reason, and precisely for that reason, that we always need to argue for more free speech, for more academic freedom, rather than restrictions upon academic freedom. So it's precisely because some people are in, are in a more privileged position and are more able to get their voice heard than others that we go down a very dangerous route if we start curtailing and restricting free speech. The response to bad ideas is more debate, more discussion, more free speech. So I don't think I've done a very good job okay. answering all the questions. I've got Mark at the back. Um, I, I, Alex, I've got the on the list. Um, you, Joanna, thank you. I, I agree with, with most of what you said, but I, I, I've got two real problems. I'll, I'll try not to take too long, but let me just... First of all, the, the issue of knowledge, I agree with you about that. However, I also think that you have an obligation to make sure that the way you present the discussions around language and reality and those debates, that you actually present those in a manner that's accurate, given your own commitments. Um, I mean, if you read Derrida, for example, or Foucault on discourse, what they insist is there is no such thing as language in the abstract. Language itself is always part of a material complex. 
Um, and I'll just take a very simple example from Jacques Rancière, who talks about an animal, if I kick my dog, who can be probably saw me walk in with, um, it may be hurt, but it won't experience the hurt as a wrong. And it's because a human being can experience the kick as a wrong, that there's a relationship between the word and the material reality. So I would want to, uh, what I would want to say first of all is you, uh, I don't think you've done justice to those arguments. I agree with you that they are misused, but there is a proper philosophical argument about the relationship between words and things, which is far more complex than you've allowed for. Um, and and you, you know, your easy condemnation of Foucault, well actually he's written an extraordinary article on discourse, which precisely undermines all of the claims that many others make about what he says. So, so that, uh, I thought that was too quick and too simple and gave you an easy argument. It almost gives you something you can kick and beat and show that it's wrong. Um, but that's deeply problematic in your own kind of books um, to, to, to actually forms of knowledge that are accurate accounts of what it is one's attempted to present. Um, with, with regard to the, uh, I mean, that's reflected the Rhodes Scholar thing as well. It's not just the statue. The Rhodes Scholarship is a legacy that Rhodes left from the money that he made from diamonds in South Africa. And that legacy is the reflection of the material reality, and that's what the students are responding to. They're not just responding to the statue. The statue is emblematic of what you spoke about, a deeper material causality, which goes back to colonial and political relations. So again, I think it's too easy to, 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 to do that. Um, to, just around boycotts, I, um, my, my parents immigrated to South Africa when I was very young from the UK, so I was there when uh, the Colin Cruz O'Brien debate took place, which you may know of us. And we, I was part of the letter at that time, we called for an academic boycott. We insisted people shouldn't come. It didn't mean we couldn't read, we read everything. But the academic boycott was precisely a boycott to make a point about the political regime that was in power. And it was those on the left who did it. And in those circumstances, I think the boycott had quite extraordinary consequences for academics who were forced to take a stand. And I wonder why you would argue in the case of the Israeli state that it would not be the same. The, the, the point is not to stop Israeli academics, it's simply to put Israeli academics in a position where they take a position on their own government and its actions. Um, <coughs> Israeli spokesman. In fact, we had them at the university trying to persuade us that we shouldn't have the boycott. We didn't stop them coming here. We had Mossad, M Mossad and uh, a set of government representatives in the debate at the UCU here a few years ago. Do you want to answer those? Because it's quite yeah, sorry, yeah. I went on, I went on a bit, but I was going to answer those. On the, the first point you made, very important point about um, aren't I just you know, looking for an easy argument here, and I haven't really gone into depth in terms of Derrida and, and Foucault. The Foucault bit, yeah, you know, guilt and, and on Derrida, guilty as charged. I mean, I, I, this is going to sound like a complete compact, but my book's 250 pages long. I've had to distill it into a 40, page, uh, 40 minute talk for this <coughs> evening. There's, I've got chapters in there on critical theory and Derrida and Foucault, and yes, I went for the cheap win yeah, on. Oh uh, yeah, on Adorno, Habermas, you know, I, I, this is this is just me saying guilty as charged, you know, for the perspective of a, a forty-minute talk. Um, on the business about South Africa and, and, and boycotts, um, my argument would be why should um, Israeli academics be held to account for the actions of their government when British academics are not being held to account for the actions of our government? I don't think, personally, I don't think we should be bombing Syria. You know, that just happens to be my own personal viewpoint. But the fact is I can come here this evening and, and talk to you without having to um, justify or in any way explain my position on the British government bombing Syria. And I think the Israeli government does an awful lot of things, well, nearly everything, that I completely disagree with. But then, so do a lot of other regimes. I'm not too enamored of Saudi Arabia. You know, I won't miss them, but you know, there's a lot of other um, governments and regimes around the world that I don't 
agree with, that I vehemently disapprove of. Um, what I object to is us holding some academics to account for a different standard than other academics around the world. Can I just ask one simple question? Is there any limits to that? So if somebody propounded um, racist views specifically on the platform you're on now, would you say they shouldn't be allowed to speak? Oh, absolutely not. I would say, please, speak more and more, because you give yourself enough rope to hang yourself. And like I said earlier, sorry, that was a very bad metaphor to use, but, but as I said earlier, it, it would completely provide me with an opportunity to argue back against them. The danger is if you don't expose bad ideas, you drive them underground, don't expose racism, you let it faster, uh, you know, ban new kids, you drive their ideas, you make their ideas more attractive, and um, have more traction in society. And, uh, I, I don't know who, quote, who, who coined this phrase, certainly wasn't me, but, but the idea that sunlight is the best disinfectant. You know, bad ideas bring them along so we can get them out there in the open, so we can argue against them. Okay, Ian, um, what is to be done if that does nothing? Bringing bad ideas into their mind, what, what is to then be done if that doesn't change anything? Get better arguments against them. <laughs> so, so, so the truth will out eventually, as you'll hear. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, if, um, if knowledge is not linked to power, then how do you explain the uh, missionary education and schooling that is very much linked to the, the processes of colonization? It's not so much that I'm saying that knowledge is not linked to power, but that knowledge is not reducible to power. Um, you know, if, if there was no connection whatsoever between knowledge and power, there would be no point in us learning anything. You know, I, I, think that there, there, I think there is a connection between knowledge and power, but I don't think the two are reducible directly one to the other. Toby. Yeah, it, it just strikes me as a very odd paradox that we're talking about uh, students, for example, who don't believe in truth and knowledge and yet fiercely condemn people having opinions. Is it because, because they shouldn't, because no one should? It seems like an odd thing to me. And you describe that as kind of symptomatic of a vacuum, I think that was the explanation. But I, I wonder if there's any more in the way of explanation for how it is that a bunch of people that we seem to have be moral and epistemic relativists should be so against people who have opinions. Mm -hmm. So should I, okay, so I'm going to leave you now just to do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, go, 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 I think that, again, that and what you've just said are both are representative of, of what I was saying earlier in terms of a lack of faith in people to win arguments, a lack of faith in people to hear bad ideas and be resilient. I think too often nowadays we have a kind of monkey see, monkey do attitude towards bad ideas that all people have to do is look at a picture of a naked woman and they will turn into a rapist, that people just have to um, hear a bad song lyric and they will go out and, and commit an act of violence, that, that people just have to listen to a speaker from, I don't know what's it called, Britain First or something like that and they will become racist and, and I don't have that much of a low opinion of people. I really think that we can put bad ideas out there and we can trust people to argue against I don't think them. anyone's making those arguments, so you obviously do have a low opinion of the people who make these kind of political arguments if you're reducing their arguments to this banality is that what we're thinking causes rape. That's not what anyone said, that's not what the students said. So you can't say that we need to respect people more and then disvalue their arguments. Right? I mean no, it's not. It's not what they're saying at all. It's a much more sophisticated critique of institutional and structural forms of oppression and of ideology and a whole lot of other things. I mean, you might disagree with that, and that's fine. But don't say that Robin Thicke causes rapists. No one says that. I, I, I defy you to... Anyway, I didn't want to interrupt.
just been in a really controlled. Just before you two, I've got Alex at the back. Actually signed that petition to have Jamaica and no platform. 
I, I think coming back to the point that you were making about um, you know what, what are institutional mechanisms that can be put in place to perhaps challenge some of these ideas. I was really pleased that the Vice Chancellor of Cardiff University said that Jermaine Greer's talk was going to be going ahead. And I, I think that's the kind of stand that more academics need to make. Uh, and again, you know, I'm using I, I, I do fully appreciate the nuances of what you're saying. I mean, I, I think one thing that we do very bad on, and our, okay, again, kind of hands up and confess, I do very badly as a shorthand, is to kind of derive managers within institutions. But I think we forget, or so, you know, again, I forget that lots of managers in higher education are actually academics themselves. Uh, you know, and, and most institutional managers are or were academics, maybe come out of teaching or out of research, but were academics in the past. Um, I'm going to go two more questions, then I'm going to finish quickly, and then Carol, and then we're done. Okay, three, three short points. One, I absolutely agree with the idea of my name, Shubham. I agree with the idea of what you're saying. But one point I'd like to make is one is not necessarily not wanting a person to appear or to speak if we don't want their view. And I've never taken part in this. I was at LSE in the 60s where we had our own revolution. Is that the, the university or the BBC or the newspaper is, has meaning in itself. So we don't want that person to speak, or we might not, because we don't want the institution to dignify that person by being seen to give it a blessing in the same way as we, we may not want to bless Cecil Rhodes with a statue because the meaning of the statue or the good flag. So that's just one point that I'd like to make. Two, the university is not the beginning of education. It's either the end or a part of education. So we can't let, allow or not have any censorship if we don't also make sure that we have a very good system of education which teaches people reasoning and questioning and the power of thought. One doesn't want to have a because I say so type of education because those people don't even arrive at the university with the tools to query. Then the third point is when I was a child I was saved by my mother from Grimm's fairy tales and from um, wicked stepmothers and from religion when she believed my mind to be plastic and not able to make my own choice. So there was a time, and I don't know whether you as a mother would agree, but one decides what one wants one's child to hear and see because perhaps their brain is fully developed in that. And this is also a form of censorship to query sufficiently what they're hearing and seeing. Okay, thanks. Cal, can I just... Uh, yeah. Um... My point's really just to kind of question the idea of freedom, academic freedom, and who that freedom is for, or really, or what, what is meant by that freedom, and whether free speech is really the most important part of that freedom. So you mentioned earlier about sort of the vocal minority, and I thought that was important because the people who are being vocal are often people who have kind of been systematically abused throughout like throughout well, history, I suppose. So we're talking the ideas which are being pushed against are like racism, sexism, and homophobia. And the accusation is that we kind of oppose these ideas out of a kind of laziness, when really I would have thought that it's more a history of reason thought against those ideas which inform our opposition against them. And I guess <coughs> we, don't, yeah, we don't oppose these ideas because we're scared of them or because we don't want to engage with them, but more because we're bored of them. <laughs> like, we've had enough of it, and part of academic freedom, in our idea, is having this ability as students and as people to create the space where we don't have to deal with that shit anymore. <laughs> because we do, people deal with it throughout society. And it's the freedom to be inclusive for people who have been abused and oppressed. <laughs> Okay, um, uh, just to see the major points I can come back to on this. Um, I think the point that you made at the end, I mean, I agreed with, with everything that you said, and I, I especially agreed with the point that you were making at the end about the distinction between children and adults, and I absolutely agree with you. I censor 
on behalf of my child, my, my 15 year old's mobile phone knocking at 9 o'clock at night last night, and it was like watching a drug addict um, being denied his last gram of crack cocaine or whatever people mentioned crash out in the window. Um, you, you know, so yeah, I, I completely agree. But I would argue that um, students are adults. And, and suddenly, I think one major difference between the protests of the 1960s and the student protests today is this idea of in loco parentis. And I think in the past, students were really protesting to be taken seriously, to have their views heard, to be treated like adults. And they didn't want the university interfering in their lives. Uh, you know, some of the most inspiring books that I've read are about the first women to go to universities. Obviously, I'm not talking about the 1960s, but kind of, um, you know, early, uh, much, much earlier than that. Um, not that much earlier, but a bit earlier than that. And, um, you know, the first women to go to Oxford and Cambridge and these stories where they had chaperones following them around all the time. But, but what's kind of inspiring in these stories is the really ingenious methods that they came up with to circumvent the chaperones and to avoid all these restrictions that were, were put upon them. And this fight for students to be taken seriously as adults, I think was a really important fight. And that's what drove a lot of the student protests in the 1960s and the 1970s. And I think what's really tragic is that so much student politics is backtracking on that nowadays. And, it, and it's asking for protection. It's asking to be looked after. And it's asking for a return to in loco parentis in all but name. And what you have um, being, being summoned is not in like apprentice, but duty of care. And, and as, again, you can perhaps link this to marketisation, you can perhaps link this to students as fee payers, but the idea that we've paid all this money, we don't want to have to confront ideas that bore us, that tire us, that we've confronted so many times before. We want this space for inclusivity. We want to be given trigger warnings. Why should we have to confront these ideas if we've paid this money? That the, the safe space was another key phrase from the end of last year. Um, you know, that, that, that's become part of the vocabulary of higher education. We've paid, we want a safe space, an intellectual, an emotional safe space. And I think that the problem with this is it, it's a, a step back from the days when students fought to be taken seriously as adults and it's it's a call for a return to the loco parentis in all but name. Words, words like abuse and oppressed are obviously very very serious words. The thing that surprises me that I can't quite work out why is a lot of the student protests nowadays are most vocal and most prominent, particularly in the States, but also in this country as well, at the most elite universities. Um, so I'm speaking to, to people you know, kind of at universities in the country, and, and it's, it's people who are at, who work, um, or are students at Oxford and Cambridge in particular. If you look at the US, it's at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, where these student protests have taken off far more than at the lower ranking universities. Now, you know, I hope you can get the violin out and everything, um, but I, you know, was the first in my family to go to university, and you know, I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. Um, I, I think if you are fortunate enough to have a place at Oxford or Cambridge, Harvard, Yale or Princeton, then you are lucky very lucky, and I think you're privileged, I think it's a real privilege to get to go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Oxford or Cambridge. I also think you're in a tiny proportion of society, and I think you're in a real elite in that society. And quite why the students at these most elite institutions are using words like abused and depressed, I think is, is puzzling. And the idea that people 
look to the past as a location to justify victimhood in the present, I find equally baffling. You can be abused if you're rich. That's <laughs> just a simple point. But, but, but also, you're calling for dissent, right? You want people to dissent, to be non-conformist, to challenge. That's what they're doing. Why shouldn't they do it at Oxford? If they can do it at Brighton, they should do it at Oxford. I don't I mean, understand. Absolutely. They can challenge. They're questioning. They're saying, we don't... It's precisely because they're institutions of privilege that they can see the hideous privilege and the oppression that inflicts on groups of people. But the irony is, um, they... Instead of looking at, I agree, there is lots of inequality in society, but instead of looking out at the inequality in society, they're focusing on a statue within their own institution. Okay, thank you. We're arguing after.